Welcome into the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Today, we're going to go the opposite direction of where we went a few weeks ago with the Legion of Exorcists. I know they said don't play with Ouija boards, but you know what? We're going to play around today uh, just because I'm that way. Uh, I have a good friend of the program on today, Karen A. Dullman. Uh, she's been busy. Boy, has she been busy. She's got a new book out there, When Cats Had Wings. And it is, uh, well, it's a, it's a book for all ages and for the young at heart, but particularly for the kids. We'll talk about that today. Karen also has a new board out there, so we'll talk about that new board as well. We'll talk about some of her adventures. We'll get to that in this program as well. Let's tell you a little bit about Karen in the meantime. Karen A. Dahlman, uh, M.A., is a published author, licensed professional counselor, noted Ouija practitioner, and host of Creative Visions TV. Having a lifelong connection with spirit beings, she discovered the Ouija board in 1973 and continued her communication and exploration into the unseen dimensions with this device. Her work and research into the realms of spirit on and off the board is showcased internationally at popular paranormal conferences like the Michigan Paracon that she'll be at in August on streaming shows such as Gaia and as a regular guest on Coast to Coast AM and other radio shows. Karen's mission is to push the boundaries of consciousness in order to assist humanity in awakening to its greatest potential. Karen holds a master's degree from the University of New Mexico in archetypal art therapy and is also experienced in hypnosis, past life regression, and channeling. And if she weren't uh, already smarter than I, and if I didn't uh, want to die of embarrassment, I would drop to one knee and, and propose to her right now. Ladies and gentlemen, here's <laughs> Karen A. Dolman. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Tim. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's great a joy to be with you. You, know, It's been a while since we've done a show together, so I'm yes, so is. super stoked to be here. Well, I'm so uh, super stoked. There again, there's that nervousness. Super stoked <laughs> to have you here today, Karen. Um, I reached out to you because it has been a, a while since we've had mm -hmm. you on, and I wanted to catch up with you. I think the last time we had you on, we were talking about animal communication, if I remember right. We, you know what? That's exactly right. Yeah. We were talking about animal communication. I was giving you a lot of examples of messages we received, and what that's become is I've really fine-tuned that process of working with animals, not just on the board, but telepathically, mm -hmm. that this is what developed this book. And you can see them right here. I've got <laughs> you guys, everything's backwards on these screens, but I have it to my side over here and uh -huh. I have one over here, yep. which is when this book was born from out of that work. So I think that was quite a few years ago. We were talking about the work we were doing. Well, let's let's get into that right away. Let's talk about that. When Cats Had Wings, yes. it says by Karen A. Dolman and Jack. Now, Jack helped write the book, but Jack is who? Jack is a cat. Really? Jack is my cat. He's a cat that is now in spirit. Okay. But when Jack started with the story, he was very much alive. Really? So you guys, it's, it, I know it sounds wild. I know Tim, it sounds wild. It, it, when you start learning to tap into consciousness of sentient beings, which would be humans or animals, anything that has an awareness about itself, just because we don't understand their level of communication or how they see themselves in the world doesn't mean they don't have a sentience. Mm -hmm. uh, an awareness, some type of awareness. Even amoebas have some type of awareness. I'm not saying they're smart and intelligent, but they have a way they move about the world. Mm -hmm. There's something they're aware of they're doing. So you start to learn to tap into the consciousness and then it expands from there. But it's a process. You've got to really be able to trust yourself when you start receiving such subtle messages. You know, Tim, when I talk about using the board, I talk about how subtle the movement is on the board and how you have to learn to feel that. And just learning to pick up on that minutiae kind of movement, okay. it really requires a lot of patience and practice of doing it and trusting that it's working because you start questioning yourself. So because of the, all the work I did on the board, and I think I got really sensitive to feeling energies, it allowed me to start feeling and hearing the animals. And we're talking about also wild animals and um, domesticated animals. And my cats um, really, because they're so tied to me, and as we are, are with all of our, all of us are with our pets, right? We're so mm -hmm. tuned into them. We kind of know when they need food, take them out to go to the bathroom for a walk, pet them. They come to us, they can solace and they understand us too. That's a level of communication that's happening. Okay. Um, 
But what happens is you can even go further with that and start maybe posing questions in your mind to your animal or even out loud. So, so let me tell you how the animal communication started. Please. It really started back in 1994. It was January 26, 1994. And I did write about this episode in my book, The Spirits of Ouija. And I, I do talk about animal communication in here because I think it's such a powerful part or piece of the function of the board or okay. basically channeling. Okay. Uh -huh. It's channeling. So I had a cat then, um, who was very much alive. I actually had two cats and one day I was using the board with my partner. And at that point we were at that day, we were actually talking to our angel, my angel named Mary, who she still comes to the board. And she said, just give us messages. And she said, you know, you're not going to believe this. Who wants to talk to you? And I was like, bring it on because I, there's all kinds of beings I wanted to talk at the time they'd come through and I would talk to all, just all these different errant spirits basically. Sure. And she says, no, this is different. You're really not going to believe this. I said, okay. So the planchette, the indicator on the board starts moving around and slows down. It goes a little different direction and it spells out Hermes cat. I love you. Now my cat, big fat orange cat was sitting in a chair, very much alive looking at us. And its name was Hermes. And I said, what? My cat just spoke. She goes, yes, you you have the ability to channel animals too. And they will want to communicate with, with you. And your cat just wants you to know how much he cares about you. And I said, what, what did he say? Meow, meow. And you translate it. She says, well, kind of. <laughs> what he said was he gave us the indication. He gave us the images. He gave us the thoughts. And we put that into words. So it's not like the cat, it's not like the cat is necessarily going, meow, meow, or I love you. It's exuding the energy uh, and that gets translated into an awareness, a consciousness. Okay. So if you tap into that. And so what I thought back then was, and I, cause I wasn't really clear on this. It's like doing the Ouija board was just letting the energies come through. And that's really not what's happening here. I've been able to evolve with this over the years and realize I'm the one channeling. I'm the one with my hands on the planchette. Yes, I'm tapping into energies, but I'm the one that's allowing it to be transcribed, if you will, mm -hmm. on the board. I'm not saying I'm not saying necessarily it's idiomotor, although I think that subconscious is a part of it. Okay. I'm not saying it's just all spirits. I'm saying it's a combination. And it's no different than somebody voice channeling uh, maybe a spirit guide or mm -hmm. a deceased person or a medium. So there's a little bit of that going on channeling. So that's basically what I was doing. I was channeling my cat. The angel, my angel was helping me learn to do that. And Hermes was part of that. And then that just grew over the years. So I've been doing it, you know, almost, what is that? Like 30 years, practically yeah. almost 30 years. I've been 29 years. I've been, I've been working with the different animals. So that just became a progression and it culminated to this book because Jack came to me and he was talking to me already on the board, but he, he, and I was very sensitive to Jack. Jack was a really skittish animal. He'd been massively abused, kicked, thrown by this ugly ass man. Mm. Oops, beep. No, that's um, right. and, you, you, okay, feel good. free. We're not, we're Sorry, not on radio. So go ahead and, and yeah. Okay. Feel free to let so, it loose. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible, man. And so I, I got him and his brother and that's, and they came to me and Jack was petrified, shook. I, so I got, I developed, I had to develop a very special relationship with him. And I, it was about patience and unconditional love. Although he was so in a way very, he was very broken mm -hmm. and it just, it, it, he warmed my heart. So we had this special bond and he said to me one day on, no, not on the board. We were sitting there and I was petting him mm -hmm. and I heard, he said, can I tell you the story when cats had wings? I'm like, where did that come from? Now I'd already, already heard some things every now and then from my cats, but this was like, wow, what do you mean, Jack? He's like, I, I got a story I want to write. He wanted to write a book. So he came to me and presented it to me. Um, through the board and off the board and in dreams as well, you guys. And he was still very much alive, um, but he would give me different renditions or versions of the story. It was almost like he had to tell his tale of how abused he was. He got that out of the way. Then he told another story about him not being able to go out and play, which I think was probably true. He was always stuck in the house um, and, and just under the bed, basically mm -hmm. where he lived, not with me, but with the man before I got him. And then he had the sense of freedom with me, but that's when he, that's when he made up the story. He gave me the storyline when cats had wings and wow. he finished the story. Here's the neat part, Tim. Okay. If that's not neat enough, <laughs> that is here's neat. the neat yeah. part. He yeah. finished it after he had transitioned over it. He was in spirit. 
Oh, wow. So it was a process of almost about five or six years working on this book with him, mm -hmm. the idea of it. And I said, when, when are you ready? He goes, well, I'm ready whenever you are. He said, but I need you to write it for me. He goes, I'm going to give you the storyline, but I want you to write it. And the, the, the best part was this. I'm going to grab this book here. Sure. This is the this is to me another really interesting part of it. I spoke to Jack. Last time I spoke to Jack on the board, well, before I, we did this book together, was uh, August of last year. So almost a year ago. And I was talking to him on the board. And then I went to bed that night after having some messages from him. He said, yeah, we're ready. We're ready to write this book. I woke up in the morning with this phrase repeating in my head. Okay. It said, not too long ago, but within your distant past, lived a hierarchy of angels known as the winged kitty cats. I went, holy cow, that's, the, that's it. And once that flowed, I heard that. And I know it's because I just spoke to Jack and he was talking about the winged cats and the stories and this girl and what happened. It just came out of me. And I just sat down with Penn and it flowed through. It was like a channeling process again, just direct. And he's now he's already in spirit, you guys. I wasn't using the board. And it flowed out of me and it just came through amazingly. And I think a few things I, I did check and, and change. Other than that, <clears throat> it came out pretty much how it is in the book. It was just so well done. And it was a combination of me tapping into his energy, his idea for the storyline, and me and then me having the freedom to put it into a prose. I didn't know we we're gonna tell it like just a regular story, mm -hmm. but this one is a rhyming, it's a rhyming story. You so, know. Karen, a lot of times when, when people say it kind of flows through me or kind of, you know, flowed through me, musicians use that a lot. Uh, authors mm -hmm. will use it, such as yourself. Um, and a lot of times they'll say, well, I don't know where it came from. You knew that it came from Jack, but at times mm -hmm. I know, I, did it feel like it was automatic or did you know the entire time it was Jack feeding it to you? In other words, um, did it feel automatic even though you knew it was being fed to you? Or did you feel like maybe it also came from spirit at the same time? I think it was a combination of both. As it was when I first spoke to my cat, Hermes, many years ago, it was the angel, angelic realm, helping this animal to have its communication through this board, through me channeling. I think it's definitely a combination. I feel like spirit's there and we spirit would be the, we can call it the universe. We can call it source. All that is God. And truly when we tap into levels of consciousness, you're using that matrix that we're all where we're all connected together to make that communication. That's what's happening. So it is tapping into a matrix where, we're, where all of us collective unconscious, Carl Jung might call it, mm -hmm. where we're, we all have the access to this Akashic record, if you will, to great spirit. And that's where the connect connections are made. So it, it's Jack's personality for sure. Mm -hmm. Yet it's intermixed with the collective unconscious or all that is spirit coming through. And I'm just channeling and tapping into that. And it was such an automatic flow. When I know when I do that, I do it. I did it with a, another poem that I wrote. Actually, my imaginary playmate wrote it was opening in one of my first my, one of my books, The Spirit of Alchemy. It was the opening okay. story that came through. So I'm not I'm not I am used to writing in prose. But it's so I can't take myself out of the equation because I'm open to that. And I'm also able to channel mm -hmm. off the board as well. So it's it's putting that into effect, but also being with the energy of Jack. Jack's energy was definitely present. And um, he and I got I tell you, I have spoken to him since the book came out. Okay. He's super stoked. He says, look how many people I'm touching worldwide. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted everybody to see that really we are angelic beings. I thought it was the sweetest little thing. What was Jack's reaction when you told him there was no residuals for him? <laughs> well, listen, he he was fed in his residuals pre. Uh, <laughs> Let's just say he lived a life of a king, okay? okay Let's just say okay. that. And he had a charmed life. And, and so he's, he's okay. And I said to Jack, I said, hey, are you Jack Dahlman? Are you Jackster the Cat? Mm -hmm. All these names I have for him. I used to call him Sai Babaji, the Holy One. And I, we, I had so many different names for him. You know, you get names for your animals and they become this really long, weird ass name. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he goes, no, just Jack. So Jack, you actually can go to Amazon.com and you'll see Jack. Jack's name is right there. You click on it. it doesn't He only has one book so far. <laughs> um, he hasn't said he wants to write another book yet. But he was he was just super happy that we worked on this together. And, and I got to tell you, I never set out to write a do a picture book. My books are usually about 220 pages. Um, they're they're um, they're nonfiction. They're about my experiences with doing spirit communication, channeling um, and, and they're, they're deeper. <laughs> but the story is amazing because 
I mean, I can't take credit for it, you guys. I can't. Um, I, I was definitely a component of that, but so was Spirit, so was Jack. Mm-hmm. And it's such, to me, every time I read it, it gives me teary eye because it just talks about this beautiful, unconditional love that the feline beings share with humanity. It's amazing. And I have the best artist. I mean, the, the images are beautiful that this this artist did. I, I can show you a few, but I hired an artist, sure. um, Maz Farzan, but... You can see they're just beautiful, colorful pictures. Oh, yeah. Yeah, most it, definitely. It's just, look at this. Look how gorgeous yeah. that is. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. It's just really, really beautiful. Yeah, so um, I was super, super stoked with the artistry. It came together nicely. He really captured my vision and Jack's vision. Um, he captured Jack's in the book, you guys. It's Jack's story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so it was actually so much fun to write. I, like I said, I've never done this before, mm-hmm. and it was it just came out this year, and I was so happy to to do something different. This is my fiftieth year this year using the Ouija board. Wow, wow, yeah, that's that's impressive. L- let me ask no, you I'm this: happy. I'm going to take a slight jump to the right here, yeah, Karen, and ask you this question. Uh, if you could do this with Jack and, and write a, a children's mm-hmm. book uh, with Jack, would it be feasible or possible to take that slight jump to the right and channel someone like, say, A.A. A. Milne, someone who wrote Winnie the Pooh or, or or another popular children's author? People do. And People do, do it. And do one more chapter of, say, Winnie the Pooh or one more chapter of Curious George mm-hmm. or one more chapter of another popular children's character and have it feel and and i'm not disparaging you at all but have it feel authentic well um jap heron jap book jap heron was supposedly uh, the um channel through the ouija board uh and it was a it was it was mark twain it's supposed to be mark twain and so what happened in the book's called jap heron and so what happened was this uh, the, the, the woman who channeled it through the Ouija board, they said, OK, then if this is Mark Twain, the family came back and said, we get the rights to this book. Oh, and then they and she ended up dropping it and, and get rid of her copies. There's still copies out there you can get. She quit selling it. But people have copies of that book and it is Mark Twain. And, and people say, well, it's Mark Twain, but it's not good. Mark Twain. But I, it, you, I, I didn't you know, I don't know. I mean, there's different phases of different people, it, you know, and the way they their writing style might change. And there's other people. There's other people that use the Ouija board that the same thing that's just not the direction i've ever gone i never thought i would do this the book the the, that kind of thing Mm -hmm. that's not really my thing but it it can be done people have done it there's books out there my my thing has always been how can we how can human potential rise Mm -hmm. how can we access our human potential and probably because my background is a psychotherapist and maybe that's why i became a psychotherapist my interest in human nature and potentiality and and being empowered. So that's really my thing. And that's, and because I, that's my focus, that's the type of energies I tend to bring. So with Jack, that's the part of Jack I channeled was this part that was such a, a wise sage that was mm-hmm. such a wise animal. Mm-hmm. And that's the part of Jack I channeled, although he was very broken by abuse, but right. there was this part of him that was so strong and very much admired uh, in the other, in the other rounds. I was told this much later about him by his half brother, who was also two transitioned a year before him. So, yeah, so it really depends when people are doing channeling where their alignment is, what, what do they believe they can do? Okay. Um, what do they think is possible? One of my girlfriends who works on the board, she channeled some Edgar Allan Poe, Poe and she read it to me. And I was like, you kidding me? That's really good. I mean, mm. I like Edgar Allan Poe and that's one yeah. of her favorite authors. Yeah. And it did sound really good, but I mean, we didn't have an expert listen to it to see what they thought, but some people have that interest. And we were, we, you and I were talking early before we came on yep. here live. Yep. We were talking about just, um, you know, channeling uh, famous people or something. Mm-hmm. And some people have that, shtick that they want to do like um barry strom i think he's been on your show yes. before yep he would do all the famous uh outlaws do you remember that he's done a lot of famous outlaws now yep. he's channeling supposedly the 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 uh, saints yep and angels and jesus and mm-hmm. you know people people channel different things he's not even working on the board anymore so it just really depends where you're aligned my, my alignment again is with humanity's potential and and empowerment and then also just allowing people to understand that the world is so much greater and grander and larger than we think and that there the unseen dimensions there is energies there that are there to help us and support us you know i the one question that pops up in my mind is this when you talk about channeling a specific person is it, not just being in tune with them 
uh, energetically, but personality wise. And, and, and you kind of touched on it a little bit. And that is this, when someone goes to channel, like your friend channeling Poe, mm -hmm. um, do the energies align Do the personalities align? Because when I think of that woman who channeled Twain, I think to myself, okay, when the family comes back and says, well, give us our royalties yeah, and, and, right. then, <laughs> and people come and, and read it and go, well, that's not even good Twain. Is it not good Twain because maybe that person who channeled Twain misinterprets Twain or is it not good Twain because maybe the energies don't align properly? Do you know what I'm saying? Or you bring up a really good point. No, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up and I call that our filters. Okay. We have our own mechanisms when we allow other energies to come through and it's our own mechanism that it, that end up interpreting that energy mm -hmm. and we get in our own way. So our filters are, which are our beliefs, cultural beliefs, how we were raised, thoughts, um, where, where we allow ourselves to go with this energy. Because a lot of times we, we just get in a box. We put blinders on. We go, oh, no, that's not possible. That's not, you can't, you can't channel a cat. That's not possible. Yeah. I never set out thinking I could. It just happened over the years, right? right, right. So you're right. You, we could get in our own way when we channel. And also when people do any kind of psychic or medium, any kind of work in the other dimensions, we do get in our way. So therefore we can interpret things through our own colored gl or glasses, whether rose or dark colored. Mm -hmm. So you might get somebody interpreting the same thing I might see as something very beneficial, helpful as another uh, extremely might see that's something very negative, but that's because of our own views, because of our own perspectives. We do get in the way and thus the energy doesn't necessarily align to be a hundred percent coming through. This is Mark Twain, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. This is Edgar Allan Poe, hundred percent. This is the Buddha or Jesus or, or Jesse James or whoever we're channeling. It, that's, that's, always a part of if you're not the ultimate source you're just the messenger and the messenger loses part in the message it's like that game the round robin yeah, yeah. you tell a secret in somebody's ear and they repeat it and it comes back to you and you're like that's not even at all what i said you know right, it's right. that i think they call that telephone too yeah same telephone. the same thing yeah so yeah. Th always because we have our own perspective ways of seeing viewing things understanding things comprehending all that's of iq eq that all comes into play here we distort the message and so yeah that's that's the that's the challenge when you start channeling, that's a challenge that we have to step aside. And I, I'm not hundred percent great at it. I can't say I'm perfect. I'm not, I'm not. I, I, so that's when you ask me about Jack, I feel like, yes, spirits coming through. It's Jack's personality. It's mine too. And together it came out really nicely. Let me yeah. ask you about authenticity when it comes to the consumer and that, that mm -hmm. has to be this. Okay. So when, when I go to buy, when cats had wings, I, I can buy into the fact that you and Jack sat down and wrote this book because you and Jack had a close relationship. Yeah. There's an auth authenticity for me as a consumer. Well, that's heartwarming. That's touching. You and Jack had this relationship on this side of the veil, on that side of the veil. Mm -hmm. I can buy that. My heart feels that. Right. When, when somebody says, well, I, I channeled Twain. Well, okay. How did you know Mark Twain? Did you have a blood relation there, or did you know each other in that life? Of course, if you're in this time and and Twain lived, you know, a hundred and some years ago. Well, I don't know that I can buy that. I don't know that there's authenticity okay. there. So, is it a matter of feeling that authenticity for a consumer to buy that book or buy into that book? Hmm. I guess I would ask that question to you. Does it? Does it? make that does that authenticity make someone buy in as far as believability for that book as well you know i think uh the authenticity authenticity factor is is huge and people consider that i would think um when i put a book out there i'll just talk to myself personally you sure. know, and then I'll, I'll go i'll expand further from there sure. um when i put a book out there it's because of my experiences and, and it's not do people are going to believe me it's just to show that there's other possibilities out there and here's some exa here's some examples of things that i've been able to do mm -hmm. um i'm actually shocked about the book jack how good it's turned out um and how well it's doing because it's just do people believe this? And it's not so much, it, I don't care if they believe it or not. It's such a heartwarming story. So people yeah. get the sense, the feeling from it and people write to me. I get, I get something almost every other day, at least they'll reach out to me and say, I read your story. It touched me. It made me think of this, uh, my animal who I miss, or I, I now I want to get another, I'm going to go rescue a cat or, you know, just all these things. It makes 
people think about and they go, wow, if you could talk to a cat, I could probably talk to my dog. So it just kind of opens people up. And I, and I'm happy where they go. I don't know if this is real or not. It, it, that doesn't matter to me. It's just that it was a beautiful story. It felt so good writing. And that's why I do what I do. And I say that for me, people meet me when they buy my books and they is because they want to know about the possibilities with Ouija typically, mm -hmm. or they're curious or they have a, their own paranormal experience or they have their own experience with the board, or they would like to use a board in channel that manner. So it's, it's, they, they believe in me and, and my authenticity of being sincere about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's an aspect of it too. So I was just going to say like with the Jap Heron book at J A P H E R R O N mm -hmm. with that book, um, what was her name Emily Hutchins? I think it was Emily Hutchins. Okay. That's going back familiar. to my Ouija history here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think she's, I can't remember who actually wrote it. But anyway, um, w w that was, she was sincere. This was legit to her. Mm -hmm. And some people said they thought it was really legit too. Just a few critics come in, but there's always critics that'll come in anytime because the person's dead already. They're going, there's no way this even exists. And that's when their filters get in the way and they're going to say anything negative because for them, they're like, that can't happen. The guy is six feet under the ground. He's, he's gone. He's disintegrated. Yeah. His spirit might be somewhere if they even believe in that. Right. So you're going to get the critics anyway, but she was very sincere about it. Um, uh, patient's worth, uh, you, that whole story about patient's worth, who was this, uh, 17th century woman who was channeled the yep. board. Yep. Um, they were very sincere about that, her work too. So it's, it really, I think when it gets to, is it authentic or not? People also maybe want, might want the entertainment. Mm -hmm. They might want the excitement. They might want to see what it is, the curiosity of it. And they may, and they may not believe it, but, the, but at least what it does. And I'd say with those books too, uh, where there's channeling Patience Worth or channeling Mark Twain or Edgar Allan Poe, it's fascinating that to even think that that could be a possibility. Yeah. Now I have to say this because we, a lot of us, do, um, don't want to go outside of our comfort zones, mm -hmm. which become our boxes we live within or how I, so we'll have bigger boxes and we'll have smaller boxes, you know, and it changes in different situations. People might be very uncomfortable that they're willing just to dismiss everything. And so I would say if you're interested in, in like reading Jap Heron, because you want to see what that's about since, since I mentioned it here, yep. or even interested in, in my stuff, it's like, you know, be just open-minded to it. And you might be surprised <laughs> that it opens you up to go, well, you know, I had an imaginary playmate one time too, that I could literally see, or I feel like my cat talks to me too, or, or you might just go, that was an interesting story. Super cute. I'll get it for my child to read. Cause it's so cute. That's it. But it's like, have an open mind to it. But what I find that people will do sometimes, and this is just human nature, mm -hmm. this is not accusing anybody of anything. And I I've done it. We've all done it. We're not comfortable with something. So we want to shoot the messenger who brings it. We're yeah. not comfortable. So we want a name call. We want to say that's stupid. That person's a stupid, crazy person. Or we said that can't happen. That's evil. And we quickly label it and shut it down and try to shoot the messenger because we, it's not possible in our lives. Yeah. Doesn't mean it still couldn't be possible for somebody else. Right. Right. Well, the one thing I, I would like to see, there's, there's certain things that, that make me curious. I mean, this week alone, uh, we saw in the news that there was a, an arrest warrant issued in Las Vegas for, and we still don't know what it's about yet as of this taping. Um, for in the in the murder investigation of Tupac Shakur, we still don't know who officially killed Tupac. Although there's a lot of different uh, suspects out there, and and one that they are strongly thinking actually killed Tupac. But you've never seen a a channeled. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to say an end to his 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 autobiography, or or you know him in yeah. his own words channeled saying this is exactly what happened that day. This is exactly how I was killed, yeah. um, which I think would be either from a psychic Amazing. side or a, yeah, or a Ouija board side mm -hmm. would be astounding. I, I think it would just be something absolutely astounding or or something in a even like with President Kennedy, something where those last moments, that last day um, that would put a lot of different things to rest, I think would be. Even even if with the most skeptical or cynical person, if they could put that aside and read that piece of literature and just let their imagination go and just read it for what it is, just as maybe an escapist fantasy. 
and mm-hmm. see what they thought of it. I, I think there's room for everyone to open up their mind a little bit and let the possibilities flow through just to see what's there. And I don't think people take that chance very often. I think if the, they get more set in their ways as they get older and there's, there's <laughs> right. not the, you know, there's not the, the chance of doing that. With that being said, I'm going to throw something out there that's going to make people roll their eyes so hard their brains hit the back of their skulls. Oh, ready for this? here we go. This will be a good one. All right. So uh, as listeners of this program know, Karen, I don't know if I told you this last year at uh, Michigan Paracon, but I have trained chipmunks in my front yard. No. I didn't tell we didn't you talk about that. Didn't we? I thought we did. No, we did not. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, they're not quite pets because they're wild animals. Okay, so, but they come to you, obviously. To oh, eat. yeah, yeah. They, they have names. They, and... Food's a big motivator, guys. We all know that. Oh, For yeah. all of us. All, yeah. all animals, we're an animal. Food's a big motivator. <laughs> yes, indeed. And they, and they eat well. Um, <laughs> so they, they get both treats, and then they, they have food that, you know, we set out for them. So I'm curious, in that situation, you know, with a, a domesticated pet, of course, they, they have names. We set out food for them, but they also have boundaries within a house and they're kept for lack of a better term with a wild animal i don't keep them they they have their own you know they dig their own dens and they roam as they please but they do have names they just know that i'm this human that shows up and sits out on the front porch and drinks his coffee and looks at a screen because i i do a lot of my work outside um and i show up with treats and I throw them treats and I call them a name. I don't know if they know what their name is. They, they, yeah, answer, right. they answer to it. Um, but are they readable? Is it something like with Jack where you were able to read Jack? Am I able to, like, one of my chipmunks' names is, is Wicket. Wicket runs around near me. <laughs> he collects treats. He, you know, he gives me the eye and looks at me. Wicket, like he, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was because he got caught in a trap when he was little. Oh. A glue trap, a sticky wicket. And believe it or not, it's it, we got him out of the trap, uh, the glue trap. And wow. Martha Stewart's good for more than just selling you sheets, by the way, uh, Karen. Oh. Uh, on her <laughs> on her website, she tells you how to get rodents out of a out of a glue trap. Which, by uh, the way, chipmunks are not a rodent. They're they're in the squirrel family. But yeah. But uh, but you can get you can get a rodent out of a, a glue trap, and we got Wicket out of this this glue trap. So he was a, in a sticky Wicket. So his name is Wicket. Unlike that's cute. Yeah, he wasn't named after Wicket the Ewok. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought the other guy's name is Sticky. Sticky and Wicket. Yeah, yeah, Wicket, exactly. Sticky. Yeah. Well, we have Wicket, we have Spud, and we have uh, Logan. Logan is the. Oh, you actually have three. Yeah, we have three of them. Yeah. But, okay. But Logan uh, is the littlest one. He's the little baby who just showed up last mm-hmm. week. And we, I named him Logan because um, he he's kicking every... There we go. Uh, I named him uh, Logan uh, because he reminds me of Wolverine. Oh, nice. I was thinking yeah. of the old movie Logan's Run. Oh, right. Well... Yeah, I, I could see that, but no, Logan. That's the first time I heard the name Logan was years. It was like in the seventies, right? Think, wasn't it? Well, me I was, too. I'm, yeah. going, I'm going way back. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. No, Logan because he's he's small and, and and he's kicking everybody's butt around the yard. So, uh, well, so so I, I I know where you're going with this. Yes, yeah. You can make, you have a relationship you've established. They're acknowledging you. They realize this is a another species or something big that can bigger than us that gives us treats. We like eating that food. So you're already establishing some kind of connection. They already trust you. Mm-hmm. Um, you've you're already in their space. They've acknowledged you. So there is a connection there. One thing that people say, well, how do, how do I do this? And I go, you know, it, it's, I find for me, it was always easier on the board because mm-hmm. I'm really good at using a channeling on the board. That's just what I've been doing for 50 years. You guys, it was harder for me to get outside of myself and channel off the board and be in touch with nature. But if you're out there and you're drinking your coffee, if you can just take a quiet moment when your little friends come up, mm-hmm. feed them and just be quiet. And it, sometimes it helps just to close your eyes too, to kind of close off any other peripheral sim- stimulus coming at you, mm-hmm. but to close your eyes and just say, okay, hi guys. But you can even say it in your mind. I actually, Jack will communicate telepathically. Okay. When I was petting him, that was all telepathic. It just popped in my head. 
And I'm like, and I, I do this every now and then with my guides, they come in they'll say something and, and I'll say, I just heard this. And I, when I do my readings, they're popping in and giving me messages, angels, guides, people's guides. And I hear them coming in. They're different than mine. That takes a whole lot of work to learn to differentiate and discern what's what. I've been doing that for a long time, but you can with the wild animals. I have done that. Or you're like, you see, like, let's say you can see like, a, well, I had a rattlesnake. You probably saw it on Facebook years yes. ago. That came, yep. Remember that? Yep. It came into my backyard, you guys. And that was when I was in California. I didn't think they were right there. I, I would expect it here in Arizona. Uh, I have seen them here too. Really? But this one came right up this wall into my backyard area. It is all hard skipped, you guys. And it wanted to drink out of the water fountain. And it coiled up, shook its tail and drank. And I talked to it later and I didn't do this telepathically on the board. And I don't know. I never seen that rattlesnake before. The only connection I had is right there. When I saw it, it saw me and it coiled up to say, watch out. I will strike if you get too close because I don't, I don't like you or I'm scared of you. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a mean thing, but that's what it told me on the board. It said, I will strike. Don't get too close. This is where I come to drink water. Now, how did it get do all that? Through channeling the energies, the connections, the snake too, and what it was, the message it was providing. When they coil up like that and they shake their tail, that means they're alert. They can, they can strike at anything where it's food or you, you know? So I backed away, got my little, vi you know, video, put it yep. on Facebook, backed away, went inside and shut the door. <laughs> that thing's not going to come through my screen door or anything else. And it left. But wow. it told me it had been going there for eight years. Now, I think when I was on your show before, we did. I think I did share that on your show yes. as well. Yep. So you can work with wild animals. It's having that. For me, it was just that one moment in time. But it was the fact that we had that moment. We had it. I connected. I was appreciative, respectful. It was happy that I left it alone because I could have called some game warden to get it. I could have tried to kill it. And everybody's like, why don't you kill it? Make it into boots. I'm like, I don't do that. I, yeah. I love my animal friends. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I didn't call a game warden. I was okay. This is their, they have a right to live there too. Now, maybe if I had little kids running around, I might've done that had the snake removed, but I stay inside. My cat stayed inside. I wasn't worried about it. So you have to think about the situation. And, but, but then again, it, there was respect. I had respect and had respect and we just left each other alone. That was the connection. That's all I needed to get that channeling. That was it. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think you might Tim, because you know, if you're, if anybody out here listening and watching this, if you're a sensitive person, and you're into the, the possibility of being able to even hear those words remotely in your mind from an animal. Try what I said. Sit silently with that animal, whether it's your own and you're petting it and you just allow it and you're going to go, oh, I made that up. That's OK. That's where it starts. I was like, who's talking? Where did that come from? You know, some random thought. Well, it's coming from somewhere. And be with your animals, even the wild ones like you feed. And, and you'll be surprised. You might get a color. You might get a sensation. You might get a sense of warmth, sadness, or, or happiness. You, you don't know. You'll, you'll get something. And you're going to go, well, that's not what I was feeling before. That's how you start this process. But it does, take, it does take time, just like the board, to learn to discern these energies. All right. Good deal. Tell you what, we're going to take our break here. When we come back, you have a new board. Karen, oh, we're gonna, yes. We're going to talk about this new board and and what it what it uh, contains, what it what it's made up of. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the different adventures that uh, Karen's been on since we saw her last. That's all coming up. Karen A. Dolman is our guest. Uh, we've got links in the description of this program to the new book, When Cats Had Wings. Uh, we also have a link in the description of this show to how you can learn more about Karen and the different things she's got going on. We'll also talk when we get back about uh, Creative Visions TV, and we'll talk a little bit about the Talking Board Historical Society. That's all coming up next when we talk with Karen A. Dahlman, our guest, right here on The Best in Paranormal Programming. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. With us is Karen A. Dolman. And uh, boy, where do we start? Karen has got uh, a huge, huge background with the Ouija board. Uh, she's in, in charge of all different types of things. She's She's got Creative Visions TV in her background. She's got the Talking Board Historical Society there. Uh, 
she's got a brand new book out there as well that we're talking about today when cats had wings we've got a link in the description of this program where you can order that book she wrote that with her cat jack so uh we've got uh, and by the way go get that book get a copy of that book it's not just for kids it's for uh children of all ages uh the young at heart there uh karen before the break we teased that uh you've got a new ouija board out there tell us a little bit about it well, I have a new old Ouija board. It's now it's my oldest board in my collection. You can see different age boards behind me, different ages, mm-hmm. eras. I got some 50s, 50s, 40s, and then go back to 1910. This one right here is a 1898. This one up here is a 1892, circa 92, 93. Wow. This board over here is my new old board. You guys, this board right here is actually 1890. This is now my oldest board. Now, I'll tell you a little about this board. This is interesting. So you can see it, it has slats to it. Okay. There's actually four pieces. These are kind of coming apart. Now, remember, now this is 1890. This is an old board. Okay. They come in different colors. Back then, that's what I learned from my other fellow uh, collectors who are very uh, good with understanding the different types of boards and how they were created and all that stuff. This era, 1890, for about two to three years, they were experimenting with different types of woods, different varnishes. So you might see this board, also different symbols and how they were tilted, like the hair. And this one, the moon is is like crescent, but sometimes you'll see them going like that. Yeah. You'll see different. So so when you start collecting these boards from this era, you're going to find that each one is unique in itself because they're all handmade. They're all hand varnished. This varnish happens to be a darker varnish. And over years, it became even more deeper and more pronounced. The neat thing about this board it has the four slats. I've been wanting one of these boards is this has the parts that hold the board together. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. This is, this is old time. Okay. By the way, somebody took um, one of those tracing uh, things uh, for patterns and ran it all over the back of this. So, oh that's, what, so that's kind of bad, kind of bad, but you know what? It adds to its story. Um, so this be, has become more of a darker, deeper wood. It's it's coming apart, but it's still held together nicely. Again, it's four slats. This is by Charles Kennard. When Charles Kennard was the one who first started the uh, company that started with the Ouija boards, he was the one that had originally started this whole thing, went off into the Ouija novelty company. Other, It changed names, okay, but this is when it was a Kennard. Kennard and, and I love this board. So it's my oldest, 1890. That's when the patent was granted. So 18. Eight, excuse me, 1891. 1890 is when they first created the board, and those were typically solid wood, solid wood, not the slats or not the particle board. Um, those were solid wo- wood, and also those would not have a, tra- a registered trademark on here. You can see that? Yep. Yep. That's because it, it was registered trademark in February of 1891. So that's that's the year era of this board. I love it. It's again, it's my oldest one now, and I and I like the fact that it's not perfect. And in mm-hmm. fact, most of my boards, they're, they're not, they're, there's so many imperfections to them or distresses, I will say, be- beauty marks that were made over the years. And I, and I, I appreciate that. This one is a heavy board. It's solid. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous item to add to my collection. And I yeah. tell you what, uh, for, for people who are listening on audio podcasts, I'll take a few screenshots here and I'll put them up at darknessradioshow.com in the blog section so you can uh, see exactly what we're talking about uh, as well as yeah. uh, we'll put the video up on, on our YouTube page as well. So, And you can check that out in our video section at darknessradioshow.com. Um, interesting stuff. Uh, you know, I, and I, I have to ask you, as part of the Talking Board Historical Society, I know at, at, at uh, normally at michigan paracon you have a a display and it's a huge yeah. display yep. uh, you've seen that before right oh yeah and and in past years you've had what's been akin to the world's largest talking board <laughs> um yeah. displayed out on on the floor which is impressive in itself how big is that talking board by the way Oh, the, the Ouija-Zilla you're talking yes, about? Yes, the that's, that's the one. It was, it was 99 plywood pieces. Wow. So we're talking, put 99 together and how huge. It was actually, guys, in Salem Salem Commons is where we released it in 2008. Uh, 2008 was that 18 or 19? God, I'm getting my years. It's so many years have gone by, Tim. Yeah, I know, um, right? 2000 and gosh, why can't I remember what year it was? 2019, I think it was. Gosh. Yeah, I, th- I think, I think you're right. yeah. um, I'm going to be on a show later tonight, a, a different show, and, and, and I'm going to have Rick's going to be on there with me, who actually created he's He's the VP of the Talking Board Historical Society, and he's the creator of that giant Ouija board. So what we brought to Michigan Paracon a few years back was just part of, of just a small piece of it, but it was pretty right. large. It's 
Yeah. It was like a part where it had the letters on it. And then we had the, we had the giant uh, planchette there. Here's a miniaturized one that Rick had made. Oh yeah. It's, this is exactly a replica mm -hmm. of what the one looked like. That yep. was large. Yep. Like 15 feet long. Wow. And I, and he also made a series of collector boards that are, I have one over here that I got from him. That is uh, an ex replica of what it was. We just look like, so it, it was, it's huge. Um, it was the biggest, baddest, largest, most craziest idea. It was just so much fun. And then everybody having an opportunity to see at least part of it, Michigan Paracon, and then take pictures with that giant planchette. You remember that? Yes, <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah. I got to, I got to stand near it as well. It was, it was impressive. I, I would have loved yeah. it. It, it was, and he had to take a truck to bring it out here. Now, when he first built it and made it piece by piece, you guys, he never laid it out until we actually got it to Salem Commons. Now he's a tattoo artist. Really? He's a dang good artist. Yeah. And he just drew each piece, you know, one big ply, but it might have one letter and a half on it. Okay. He did it all in his workshop, this, this garage he had, and then he had to get a semi truck. His friends who had, we're talking a big semi truck with the big, trailers yeah <laughs> and they, to fill it up we filled up two giant cartons and they have right out with a semi truck to even get it from new jersey over to boston or salem wow yeah that's and now it's being he has it in storage right now uh we never know where it could show up again or what else could happen with it but it, it was amazing experience being a part of that i don't know if i even want to think about how much it costs to store that thing He's got some good connections. We'll put Does it that he? way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. People yeah. really, we had a lot of support to do this and he has a lot of friends and buddies that, that helped, helped out along the way. And, and you guys, a lot of you out there too, there was people that donated money and, and yeah. time to help us with this. So we, we had all that covered. It was a, it was quite a, a venture. And then in fact, Michigan Paracon the year before we brought it or before we did it. So a couple of years earlier, we came to Michigan Paracon and we had one of our big displays in the room. Mm -hmm. We, we collected donations from people that also helped pay for that board. So paint supplies, shipping it, all that stuff. We couldn't have done it without the donate donators we had. Absolutely. I know that, were they also selling tickets the year before as well? I think they were, they were doing a raffle as well. But yeah, yeah. we, well, we were, I think we were at the point we were, we were doing a raffle of a board because we wanted mm -hmm. to get, um, money. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing that. You're right. Yeah. And then yeah. we just took donations all up to the very end. Yep. And, and yep. at this point, people are still very helpful in terms yep. of where you can store it. A lot yeah. of people came together to, to, to help out. And that was a great thing to see. That's, oh, that's it was, one of it was the... it, Salem loved it. They're like, when are you guys come back, we were only supposed to be there for a day. That's what the permit was, but we ended up being there for about a day and a half. They allowed that and people didn't want us to take it down. Yeah. That's how exciting people got there and like, Oh my God, I, you're packing up. I just got here. We came from, I'm like, well, sorry. We, you, we only had it for like a day, day and a half. Wow. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. It was, it was very well received by Salem and the people there. Wow. That's really cool. Um, tell us a little bit about the Talking Board Historical Society for those of us who don't know. I mean, we've had you, we've had Bob Merch, we've had others on this on the show throughout the years. But what what are the goals of the Talking Board Historical Society? What it is that you're out there trying to do? Well, our mission is really to educate and celebrate the men and women, the people who came together and created this board. And over the years who have been using them or collecting them, it's a group of it started loosely as a group of, of collectors um, who became friends. And then it actually became a, a nonprofit organization, 501 C3. And that's what we are to this day. We, we sell merchandise and all that merchandise goes. We all volunteer. It's a volunteer position. We, we that merchant that money goes to doing things such as Ouijazilla, mm -hmm. to putting up plaques where Ouija was first built. We put it, what a plaque in a uh, Seven Eleven. Actually, it's the building where uh, the Ouija board was made in in uh, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. We will, when we did WijaCon, mm -hmm. right? The WijaCon yep. thing. We did a plaque with the mayor. It was a big deal. So we're always planning new things. We're always educating the public and. Um, I, I even donate some of my books there that can be sold and the money will go to TBHS directly. Um, so, but yeah, so we, we have a website, tbhs.org. You can learn more about all the different, uh, directors that are there and what our backgrounds are. We're all, we're all unique. We're all very different people in terms of beliefs, uh, you know, what we do. I'm, I'm kind of the one that's known as the one who uses the boards. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of us are collectors. All of us love any kind of board. We love Ouija boards, but we also love, you know, regular talking boards, spirit boards. And there are a difference. And Tim, do you know what the difference is between a Ouija board, spirit board, talking board? I'm putting Tim on the Ooh, spot. Boy, you you're putting me on the spot. I'm guessing hey. Ouija is the commercial name. A talking board, let's see, a spirit board and talking board. Um, 
Gosh, you know, I, I honestly, you put me on the you're, spot. You're that, on it. Okay, you guys, Ouija is a registered trademark name Hasbro owns. Yes. So it's okay. like it's like calling all tissue Kleenex. Right. And, and it's call not. all boards Ouija boards. The truth right. is like this one back here is just a talking board from the 40s. It's called the Mystic Tray okay. by a whole different company. They wouldn't put Ouija on there. But you got over the years, so many different boards were made that were just called talking board is like an umbrella term. Okay. And so is spirit board. Okay. That's what we call ourselves the talking board historical society, not Ouija board. It, it, number one, it's patented trademark. We, 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 we can't be using that, yep. but we can use talking board because that's not. And everybody, everybody, every board's a talking board or a spirit board, but not all boards are a Ouija board. Okay. Because it's a name. Yeah, yeah, I just, I, I, I psych yeah, myself you, you, out you between know, You have talking. a board yourself, you, you, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. Yes, I have a, I, yes, we have a darkness radio uh Talking board, yes, yeah. See, and, and you, you, you people just call everything Ouija because that's what they're used to. It's like everybody calls tissue Kleenex. I'm a guilty of it. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. call all my tissue in the house Kleenex, and though it's yes. not Kleenex brand, yes. See, yeah, yeah. we do it. Um, yeah. So, but 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 you can call them anything. Uh, but technically, these this is a real Ouija board. These are real Ouija boards. Yeah. Now, I have I, you guys. I. You, when I'm looking at Tim, I'll tell you, I have three tiers going up 11 feet this way, like these, these shelving systems and six feet this way. I have at least 35, 40 boards behind me on these shelves. You can't see them all, mm -hmm. but most of my boards are Ouija boards. Um, probably what is it? What did I say? 60, 65% are Ouija's and the rest are talk, just talking boards, spirit boards. Like, Cause I really like all boards that you can use to talk with. And I have some that people make me that are homemade, handmade. I have some really beautiful pieces that are on my shelves. And then I have the ones you can buy that are mass produced. Yeah. You know, yeah. Such as all these boards behind me are, we're all mass produced at one time. Although the older boards, like I said, were all handmade. Um, and each one would be different because of the stain, just how it, what it looks like ages over the years with the stain, the varnish, all that stuff. What is the most valuable talking board, spirit board, Ouija board you've ever mm. run across? Well, Bob Birch has the original one, a prototype that would belong to Miss Helen Peters. Okay. And it does not, it's not stamped at the top with Ouija or registered because this is when they were just playing around with the idea before they even had the name of it. Really? And there were a few of those out there and Bob has one. And I've, and there's a picture of me on my website holding it. I think it's still on there. If not, it, um, it, he, we, we showed, we did show it um, at Michigan Paracon that one year you yeah. were there. Yep. You saw it. Yep. Um, there's some other ones. There's this magnetic one. It, so what it is, it's a, it's a, well, magnetic. Is that the right word? Yeah, I guess so. But it's, it's a, it's a metal board that had electric electrical board work behind it. Meaning if you rev the planchette over the, the pieces, it would light up when it hit bumps on the board. Oh, okay. And so the board would actually light up the way the letters were. And that was so rare. It still is rare. Gene Orlando, who runs the museum of talking boards.com online. Uh -huh. Great museum. You guys museum of talking boards.com. Check it out. You'll see that board on there, but it's a metal board uh, pre-war. And when we went to war, they, they, most of those got scrapped and made into metal, you know, so they can make it into ammunition and stuff, tanks, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but he has one, he kept it. It still works. He showed, he showed it on my show on my creative Asians TV show, but that one's a very, very rare board. There's some boards out there that are so unique. They're not Ouija's. That one is, a, that, that is a Ouija board. That's a, it's called a mystifying Oracle, but it, but they own, they own that name too. That's also a Ouija board. Um, that metal one I told you about, um, and then there's other ones out there that are not Ouija boards, but they are very valuable to the Nolo board. There's, uh, there's just so many different boards out there. It, um, go to Jean's museum of talking boards.com. You will see some rarities. Jean, Jean has a, a really profound collection, amazing collection. And he got into collecting before people were collecting like back in the sixties and seventies. Uh -huh. So he got his boards really pristine and, and uh, in good, beautiful shape, beautiful, gorgeous boards and inexpensively. Oh, now you okay. can pay up to several thousand dollars for boards. Yeah. Now on these older boards that people do. That brings up an interesting point or an interesting fact. A lot of the, and the boards you have in the background are beautiful, made out of some beautiful material. You see yeah. everything from cardboard to wood to metal, like you were mentioning. Yeah. Um, what's the most unusual compound you've ever seen a board made out of? How about glass? I have a glass board. It's etched. It's really? beautiful. It's actually on display in my coffee bar. Really? <laughs> got some coffee and do a little Ouija. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, my board partner had that uh, made for me. He, he commissioned somebody to do that. And it's beautifully etched um, with different spirit guides around. It's just, it's gorgeous. I've shown that before on my 
uh, Creative Visions TV channel. That's a very unique one. Oh, it's actually on my galleries, on my website too. I think I have it there. But that's that's a unique one. I haven't seen too many glass boards. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a glass, beautiful glass planchette. I had to put little felt pads so it could go smoothly over the glass. Um, I've seen people make uh, ones out of metal too. I have a really beautiful one that's made out of a tree stump, part of a tree stump cut sectioned off. It's more of in a triangle like shape. Yeah. Um, it has crystals embedded in it and some, and some sigils. Uh, it's a powerful board. I love it. I love that board. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've seen them made on tables. I've seen them, you know, on the wall, what, what, that stranger things, they had that thing on the, it was like a Ouija board on the wall, right? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. I've seen it, you know, on rooftops, <laughs> guy painted one on the roof and there's Rick's big board, you know, laying out there in plywood. You yep. could see all different, you know, things being used. I find that what you really want to look at when you, you if you make a board mm-hmm. or ha- or buy a board, it, it, or you want to, if you want to use it, and I'm not talking about collecting is a whole different story, but if you want to use it, you want something that's going to be a smooth surface. Mm-hmm. And so like the tree stump one, she put, I, I'm looking at it over here. That's why I keep looking over there. Okay, yep. um, she put a lot of varnish on it, like really thick varnish. It's like a glassy like top to it, gorgeous. So that helps to have the smoothness because it's easier for the planche of the indicator to move. So that's always important when you make your own. I will make them out of just cardboard pizza boxes. I'll talk to you about that before paper sacks. Mm-hmm. Yep. That works. Yep. Um, in fact, I'm teaching a workshop on using called Wild, Wielding the Ouija in Michigan Paracon. And, and we will be making our own boards and I will bring boards for people to use. But I want people to try out even using pizza boxes and cardboard that I'm bringing and um, homemade ones because they all can work. And why do you think that is, Tim? Why can any board work? Because it's all about intention, Karen. It's Correct. And it's ourselves. Yeah. We're channeling. We're doing the work. If you are strong enough as a channeler, meaning you, you feel comfortable doing things on different, every board I have, I, I, it works. Mm-hmm. Google that board doesn't work. Well, it does because I work, I channel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm good at channeling. This is what we're doing. We're channeling. So um, I can use like, what do I got? Where is it? I have, a, oh, it's right here, you guys. Here's my mouse pad. This oh, works. Yeah. 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 This works. Yeah. And this can be my planchette. I've done that before where this, I say point on this corner. Using your mouse? Yeah. Yeah. I'll use my mouse. I've used that. I, sh- I do shows where I show using anything you have in the house as a planchette. Okay. I've used my phone. Of course, glasses work great. Uh, pup, uh, t- uh, Tupperware, uh, rocks, coins, the the mouse. <laughs> huh. I've used a lot of different things. Scotch tape roll. It, it doesn't matter as long yeah. as it can smooth, uh, move and slide. When you get into rocks, it gets a little hard. Um, but as long as you can channel it, th- those tools will all work. It's It's really quite fascinating when you start realizing you could be anywhere and you want to have this tool and you want to use it and just pop one out and say, Hey, you got some cardboard or you got some, some paper, or paper sack. I've been known to do that since the day, many days ago, back in the eighties and nineties, I'd be somewhere and they go, let's use the Ouija board. I go, okay, get me a paper sack. You got a marker, you know, and then we, away we would go. Wow. We would, you, now I'll tell you what I've seen. That's interesting. Now I don't do it this way. Mm-hmm. I met this woman in California. She was, she was very good at using the Ouija board as well. And I went to, I wanted to go see her use it. And she would use it by herself. She would take her board and use her finger. And she felt spirit move her finger and she would go to the letters. So it'd be like this. She yeah. would, she would just go D and then go here or whatever. And then it, and she would, yeah. So I'm like, wow, how does that work? But it did. She was able to channel. So how, this is how I liken it to. People okay. do automatic writing. Yeah, yeah. Take a pen, paper, write. Okay. Yep. That's kind of what she was doing, but using her finger. And she would get these really profound messages. I was just blown away. Okay, so how does that differ from having spirit move the planchette? Now, we've always been told, and, and I shouldn't say we've always okay, been Okay, yeah, told. let's talk about this. Yeah, so now we get warned by certain individuals or certain so-called experts that that – Okay, you you want the you want the spirit to move the planchette. You don't want them to move you. The idea is that you're using the Ouija board as a communication device. So, mm-hmm. wouldn't you want to discourage someone from moving or using your finger to move yeah. you? No, I have no fears. I have no fears about that. I have no and, and you guys again. I've been doing this for fifty years. Somebody goes, ah, oh, she's gonna get possessed by a demon. 50 years later, here I am. <laughs> I'm having a great life, you guys. I am. I'm, I'm loving life. Okay, so so no. This one was so experienced, she got rid of the planchette. I think one day she couldn't find it, and she said, well, why, why couldn't spirit move my finger? 
You've got to be open to the possibilities. Again, when we start talking about this in the very beginning of the show, this is such a subtle thing that happens. And so I have done spirit writing, automatic writing, where you go like this and you actually, and I'm, I'm moving it myself, but you can feel the pen being guided as if there's energy coming through it and it's going on its own. Okay. But you're, you're holding it, you're holding it, but it's moving and your hands going. And so it's so, so is that idiot motor? Is it subconscious? It could be a little bit of that too. Again, I, I don't want to separate everything away from, from that communion of all these alignment of planets. <laughs> it's okay. like the, the alignment of, of all these possibilities come together for things to happen. Um, but, but so that's no different than automatic writing, which is what a lot of people do or the pendulum when they use that, yeah. it just automatically starts moving. Yeah. So it, you're part of that energy. So I don't, I don't say it as a negative thing. You're part of that equation. You, you are part of this tool. You are the tool, but we'd, we'd like to have as Clyde Lewis told me, we like to have the theatrics. And the board with the planchet moving becomes a way to show the display of a channeling. So I, I work a lot now, you guys, when I used to do readings for people through the board. Okay. Do you imagine how long it took? Yeah. Hour and a half to get like maybe a page. Now I do readings, 20, 25 minute readings and there's boom, but I'm channeling directly. I'm hearing the inspiration and I'm sharing it as I get it. And so that's, that's the same concept. The common denominator here is myself. I'm willing to allow myself to be open, learn to discern, to hear, to receive, and to and to speak it and not censor it. That's what I've learned to do. And that's taken many years to do that. So, but it started on the board because that's, that's for me was I always thought, oh, the board does it all when I was little. I didn't understand that. It wasn't until I got a little bit older and I started working with the different energies and the angelic realm or the animals and back in the eighties and nineties where it really shifted for me. And, and the biggest shift, I will say this, Tim, the biggest shift that I made with this tool that I, when I work with people now, and I, this is one of the main things I talk about mm -hmm. if they want to work with this tool or, or let's just say they want to channel, they just want to bring in their spirit guides information or their higher wisdom. I say, learn to speak with your higher self. Okay. That's that part of you that is in spirit. That's the part of you that is larger than your body. It, you could call it your soul self. It's the part of you that will always exist and reaches back and into this, this unconscious realm, sub, um, the matrix, the consciousness of all, the awareness, divine divinity. It's your part, your spark of yourself. And that they talk about this in all cultures, all traditions. They have different names for it. Um, I like to just call it my higher self. That's a very union term, Carl Jungian term, mm -hmm. the higher self. Um, and when I learned to make that contact with my greater self, higher self through the board, it, that's when things opened up for me. It was like that once I made that contact, the guy, my guides, I work with the guides, I call them, they call it plugging into the outlet of your higher self. When you plug in, it's almost like the image of taking a cord <laughs> to turn electricity, uh, some electrical appliance on, you plug it into the outlet. And so once you plug in and you can do it many, I teach, I teach how to do this okay. many different ways you can do it. Well, once you start making that connection more solid, that's when this goes off the charts with channeling. And this is when you realize you are the tool yourself. You are, you are the lighthouse that sends out the, the signal and you're also the one that receives it. It's like you're both, you're, you're you are your own GPS. Okay. <laughs> I call it my, the, my guiding uh, personal spirit. You are, you are really your own spirit guide. Let me ask the one question I know a lot of people are burning right now to ask, and that's yeah, this. ask it. Let's do it. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people who warn against the Ouija board say this: before you sit down at the Ouija board, you must cast that white light of protection, or you must put that protection in there so that you prevent anything that may be potentially malevolent from coming through. Is that part of what you're teaching as well? Are you trying to keep anything or filter that that connection coming through? Or are you more skeptical that something malevolent would come through? No, I think that's important. And I like to use the word centering. Okay. Um, which, which is basically find the light within yourself because you are a divine being. Okay. And then that light expands through you and goes out. So the light starts within you mm -hmm. and then it merges with the greater light out here, which we might call God, all that is source universal. So yeah, I do teach that. And I think grounding is another really key aspect and it's putting your awareness into the earth and, and rooting yourself into that. Because what I find is, and, and I've talked about this in some of my books, people can get really obsessed, not possessed, but obsessed people think they're possessed. And I'm not going to discount what people believe. Remember your beliefs will really influence 
anything you do in these unseen dimensions and anything you do in the seen dimensions, what we believe is really what makes us move about our lives and how we experience our life. So uh, I think it's important to um, look at that, look at your beliefs, what we talked about earlier, your perceptions, your filters. How do you see yourself? Are you a pawn to evil? Are, are, is evil is evil an entity out there? What do you believe? I, I, I give people and I say, what are your root beliefs here? We have to look at that because that's going to either help you or hinder you or put yourself here when it comes to the Ouija board in a box which says that's evil, that's bad. Well, maybe it's that you don't understand it or, or maybe you don't care to. That's fine, too. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you want to know more about it, then it, you kind of have to expand that. And the way to do it for yourself, I find people's comfort zone and find what works for them in terms of what kind of centering, grounding, protective light they want to use. A lot of people use it, come to me with this different kinds of backgrounds. They might be uh, um, very religious, devout on some kind of practice. It could be Wicca. It could be some other spiritual practice, or it could just be some kind of religion. And they, how do I work this into that. I go, well, well, you tell me what you do that makes you feel very sacred and very um, centered when you do that practice. And they say, well, it's me saying a prayer or it's me lighting some candles. It's me doing incense. It's me visualizing the white light. It's me calling in the different beings of the corners. I mean, everybody has their own practice. And I say, bring that to it and let's make this yours. Let's don't throw away what, what's working for you. Let's bring it to this. This is just another form of divinity another form of connection, of communication, another form of reaching out um, into the energies and, and allowing them. And what you find after a while of doing this, you will find that you get good at being able to go quickly into that space of what you call protection. Because you've realized that you are so empowered, which we really are very powerful beings. We, that's all been taken away from us. And we have been told mistruths about who we really are. We really are these incredible beings. And it's, it's such a... Um, a blessing and on one level. And it's also, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's an honor mm -hmm. to be here and the bodies we're in. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of beings want to be here right right now. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about what's going on in the world. It's like, this is a real critical time to be here. And, and so we are very fortunate to be here and we chose to be here. And when we start learning about who we really are, then we realize we are always within the light. We just forgot that and we've covered it up. So then we have to bring it back in, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I still do it. I yeah. still do all of that. Yeah. It just happens a lot quicker now because I'm, I, I, it's like, it's like, you know, when you learn to drive a car, you get in, you're like oh, kind of scared. How am I going to shift? And what am I going to push? And, uh, uh, and then also it comes together and it's automatic. That's mm -hmm. what happens when you start channeling you get to an automatic place of it, where it just feels very, very comfortable. And you know how to tap into that really higher energy every time, which is what I do now. I just work with the guides. Sometimes other people's spirit guides come through, but I bring in the guides, which is making that directly to divine source within myself and outside myself. And that, that becomes the connection source. And then the messages come through that. And it's a, it's a channel. Uh, this is what I, I explain it as. It feels like a pure love coming through me and I'm just channeling love. And then I'm speaking from that place of love. Let me throw this question at you because this is, this is going to be probably one of the most challenging questions I'll ask you today. That's, Ooh, I like a challenge. Okay. That's this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the uh, three of the uh, cast on from the Legion of Exorcists, and mm -hmm. they see the tool that you use as absolutely having no redeeming value whatsoever. They see it as just a tool of evil. How do you answer clergy or someone that sees no redeeming value whatsoever in what you do? Well, that's out there. And it's out there for anything. And it comes forward and says stuff about, because it's, again, it's uncomfortable. And they say, what well, were the experts? Or I'm a fifth generational witch. And they say, never mix with this. Or I'm a clergy and I'm a this or that. It's like, well, that's because you don't understand it. And for you, you're right. It'd be in the wrong hands because your life is so full of demons and so full of black and white. In my life, it's not that way. There's shades of gray. There's a continuum. And I found a way to feel comfortable with this tool. And it was early on. You guys, I got it at the age of eight. And it was, I got it from Santa Claus. Went to church the next day. I was a devout Catholic. My family really was. Mm -hmm. it, they, they just thought this was a game and a toy. And then when they realized, you know, I was able to actually have some communications. It was always, for, it was always positive for me. But I, I can't say it's going to be like that for everybody. Again, it's really how you're how your life, how you're, how you're structured, what you, what you believe about somebody coming from a, a very devout faith. Um, you're right. They're going to say, this is a devil's 
toy devil's workshop is what that is. And I don't blame them. That's what they were told. And they're going to hold on to those beliefs. And that's going to make it so what we talked about earlier again, make it so solidified for them. And for me, I being a Catholic, we did talk about guardian angels. So, and I, we, we always say a little prayer to our guardian angels along with Mary and Jesus and God and all this stuff. But I, for me, it was, that was okay to have communication with angels. And so that was one of the, after I was speaking to deceased people, I, that's when the angels, angels started coming through after I made the contact with my higher self, there was that higher level of energy that started coming through. And I was open to that. See, I believe that could be possible. Maybe, maybe. Cause I didn't know what I thought a Ouija board was talked only to dead people. And mm-hmm. by the way, they're not dead. They're very much alive. Just in another realm. They're in spirit form, another realm. And so I see it as, because, and again, somebody's going to say it's negative because again, their belief system, where they, where they came from, but what they've been told about it and their only experience with it. And so instead of being open to saying, okay, I don't like this. It's not for me. And I'm gonna leave it there. They're going to name call me, or they're going to say this is evil and just label it. And I'd be very careful who anybody labels anything like this. If it's not for you, it's not for you. But when they just start labeling something and not understanding it, that's where I see, I would almost run for the hills to not be around somebody that's so much into labeling and they they think they have it all figured out. I will tell you, I don't have it all figured out, but I will tell you this, when I feel love, when I do my messages and readings, and that's what I feel it's a positive and the clients that work with me feel that that's a win-win. That's what this is about. Again, for what my, my work of this is to show, yeah, the Ouija board can work in a very positive way, but it's a tool. Yeah. In fact, anytime you touch a tool, it's the user who chooses to use it and how they choose to use it. So boards are not inherently evil by themselves. I've got, like we mentioned earlier, cardboard, metal, uh, glass, compressed particle board, solid wood, slats. <laughs> They've got it all. It's not these, that's, that they're just inanimate objects. Yes, I know objects can have energies, but for them to work, it's, it's through the vessel of myself. Huh. That's how you really channel. It's the vessel through the person. And, and, and again, you can't take that away from my beliefs and all the other aspects of my life. And so for somebody to say it's evil, not know a thing about my life or where I've been with this tool and all the deep work I've done on myself and where I come from it on a spiritual level is to me, that's blasphemy. <laughs> that's blasphemy. And it's doing the public a disservice. I say, I don't try to convince anybody mm-hmm. if it's evil, that's it is for you. That's where you're absolutely right for me. No, it's not. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with the demonologists and the clergy and saying all these things. I, I, that's, that's their experience, mm-hmm. but, but they're not willing to hear my experience. I'm willing to hear theirs. They're not willing to hear mine. Um, so that that's, that's where, I, you know, people just want to shut it out with a label yeah. or a name calling yeah. or evil, but it's not, it doesn't have nothing. A gun, a gun doesn't kill people. People kill people. People pick up the gun and shoot somebody. A gun does not kill people unless it accidentally goes off. Then that gun should have been locked up. It's the person that uh, irresponsible didn't lock it up or, or kept bullets in it. You see, mm-hmm. that's what mm-hmm. you got to think about. This is just wood. I the, be, look at this. Look how beautiful that piece of wood is. It's gorgeous. And you guys, I have them all over my house. And in fact, this room has, I will have about 85, eight, I think it's 80, my 86 board now, but wow. I have them. I'm in my, my office, my wall, Ouija. I've got them everywhere. I've got them, like I said, in the coffee bar, I got them all over the place and it's been nothing but very positive. Uh, and they're conversational pieces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good energy. It's been yeah. good energy for me. There you go. Well, that's that's what's important, that it's good energy. So there you go. I agree. Anything there you do, go. um, it, it you should feel good with doing it. And yeah. this is just in life. And, and, and just feel good energy. And if it's not, you, somebody talks to you nasty and you're like, that's not really a friend, you know? And, no. and you're thinking, you know what? Maybe they had a bad day. I can forgive that. But if they keep doing it, you're like, I'm not going to be around that person anymore. I'm going to change things. So that, that, that's how I see the energies. You know, you, you work with the energies. You decide if, if this is going to work for you, a, a, a channeling tool, mm-hmm. or just learning mediumship or animal communication. And then you, you would just basically think, oh, that's just, BS. It doesn't really work. That's fine too. That's all. It's all good. We all got our, we all have our opinions. Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. We all have our opinions. Uh, Before we go today, I want to, I want people to learn a little bit about creative visions publications and where they can check you out uh, on the screen. Okay. So creative vision publication is my website, creative visions, publications, 
com or karenadalman.com. It is also my publishing house that does my books. Uh, Creative Visions TV is where I am on YouTube. I have a channel there where I interview people like much like this, mm -hmm. as well as I, I do. You, you, you can see some of my live sessions there and stuff like that. Work in the board. I talk a lot about the board uh, or about channeling spirituality and those things, grounding, uh, protection, all that stuff we cover there. Um, come join me there. You can look at Creative Visions TV um, on YouTube or just Karen A. Dahlman. You'll find me anywhere on social media or the different areas under Karen A. Dahlman. And, and come join me and be, and yeah, you guys go to amazon.com. If you like this book, it's, it's 10 99 for the soft, soft copy, uh, 17 99 for the hardback, which is really, it makes nice gifts. Um, and enjoy it. Let me know what you think. You can read what people have already been saying about it, but, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on, on here and talk with everybody. And Tim, it's great seeing you. We got to hang out a little bit at Michigan Paracon last year, and mm -hmm. it's always a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. When Cats Had Wings is the name of the book, uh, Karen A. Dolman and Jack are the authors, and we have a link in the description of this program. I encourage you to go out and get the book right now. Uh, like Karen mentioned, it's uh, only ten ninety nine right now on paperback, and it's not just a book for kids. It's a book for uh, people who are young at heart. So go out and get a copy for yourself. And Karen, if people bring it to Michigan Paracon, they can get it signed, I take it? That's right. I'll be there signing books. I'll have all my books there. I will have this book there too. If you want to buy it for me directly, I will have it at Michigan Paracon and I will be happy to sign it. And Jack signs it too, because I have a stamp with this paw print. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's, a, I, I make it a very special thing <laughs> when you get this book. It, it, yeah. Cause it, it, it's, it's so, it's so special. It's a special book. I even put a special cover on it. It's Yeah. That is yeah. so cool. That I wanted so Jack cool. have a way to sign it, so I have a cat stamp in it. Yeah. It'll be on there with my name, too, so it's, it makes it fun. That yeah. is so cool. All right. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, and we'll have a link as well to uh, Michigan Paracon to get your tickets. You can go out and uh, see Karen out at Michigan Paracon as well. Karen, thank you so much for being with us today. You betcha. Thank you for having me, Tim, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Sounds good. Bye, everybody. I want to thank Karen A. Dahlman for being on the show today. The book is When Cats Had Wings. It's written by Karen A. Dahlman and Jack, her cat. You can check that out in the link in the description of this program. Also, Karen A. Dahlman will be at Michigan Paracon. There's a link in the description of this program as well as to where you can get tickets to go see Karen at Michigan Paracon. I encourage you to go meet her, uh, check her out. She's just an absolute light in this universe. You want to uh, just uh, get to experience her for yourself. Uh, sit down with her, have a talk with her, and and find out more about what she does. If you want to find out more about what she does, we have another link in the description of this program to KarenADolman.com. It's everything about her. All her links are there. Uh, how you can check her out on Gaia TV with George Nori. Her own Creative Visions TV link is there as well in Creative Visions Publications, so you can get uh, the entire scoop on what's going on with Karen A. Dahlman. I want to thank you guys so much for being uh, loyal listeners of the program and uh, your, your creative feedback and your creative feedback on not only just guests that should come on the program, but uh, input on the program as to who you want to hear as well. If you have other input you want to put in on the program, just email me, Tim at darknessradio.com. I look forward to your input on the program, things that you want to see on the program, uh, guests you want to hear on the program, things like that. Uh, your stories, your Parashare stories. We welcome all of them. Please uh, email me, Tim at darknessradio.com, if you want to type those out and leave them in email form. Or if you want to hear your lovely voice on this program, go to darknessradioshow.com, click on that blue button on the right-hand side, leave us a voice note. You have two minutes to leave that voice note. If you need more time, click on that blue button again, leave another two minutes, I'll stitch it together. And you'll have a total of four minutes to leave that uh, voice note. If you need more time, well, you know the drill. You just keep clicking that button. But please don't leave any 50-minute opuses that we need to sit and listen to. I'll be editing you down from there. You know, I had a listener email me earlier in the week and ask me, uh, Tim, what happens with Stitcher? Uh, you know, I had, I had said earlier in the month that Stitcher is going away. It's going away as of August 29th of this year. And I've had some Stitcher listeners that are concerned. They want to know, well, what happens if this goes away? And Stitcher is going away. It's not, a, it's not an illusion. I'm not, I'm not blowing sunshine up your skirt here, folks. Uh, the Stitcher app is going away. And 
Darkness Radio isn't going away, obviously. All the shows on Stitcher will no longer be there. They're being transported over to Pandora. Basically, SiriusXM is folding all those podcasts over to Pandora. So the, the simple answer to this question is this. If you haven't received an email by now uh, from Stitcher, if you're a Stitcher premium member, you'll get a, an email to your registered email box saying that uh, everything is transferring over to Pandora and encouraging you to download the Pandora app. Uh, and, and Darkness Radio is in Pandora. So you, you just would automatically search out uh, Darkness Radio and you would have your shows from there. You may even log in with your current login. I don't know quite what the migration system is for that to go from Stitcher to Pandora. It probably is easier than what I'm giving you. I'm probably not the guy to go to for Stitcher relations. You probably want to go to their uh, listener relations email and ask them that. They're They're very good over there at Stitcher and they'll be able to... Uh, give you all the information on that. But let me read to you what I got on the the vendor end of this thing, because that's probably the best thing to tell you is on the vendor end of this thing, this is what I got. So that that way you can you can know from our end what it is that what we're dealing with and basically reach out to our listeners and remind you that August 29th, the Stitcher Premium Service will end operations. At that time, listeners will no longer be able to access our show, Darkness Radio, on the Stitcher app. Now, most Stitcher website pages will be redirected to the sister app, Pandora. No new listener data after August 29th will populate via hosting services. So you won't be able to get anything via Stitcher as far as Darkness Radio goes after August 29th. So what does it mean for you? Now, on August 29th, 2023, the app may be open, Stitcher that is, but listeners will no longer be able to access their show lists, downloads, preferences, or listening history. The app will not be available to download from the app stores, so you won't be able to get Stitcher after August 29th of 2023. Most show pages on the Stitcher.com website will be redirected to the sister app, which is Pandora. Now, we're encouraging you to use whatever it is that you use to switch over to Pandora and do it now so that you're not affected on August 29th when it comes time to switch over. So if you just switch over to Pandora, uh, which is the easiest thing to do, then do so. I've been asked, well, can we do something else? You're free to do whatever you want. We're not encouraging you to do one thing or another. If you're on Apple, if you use an iPhone, iPad, an uh, Apple Watch, whatever it is, and you want to continue to use darkness radio we do have darkness radio app for apple that continues to stream the shows and you remain uninterrupted uh otherwise there's there's other things out there there's spotify there's the iHeartRadio app uh there's the apple podcast app as well that will allow you to continue to allow you to listen to the show anywhere wherever you get podcasts i'm not i'm not discriminating against one or the other but wherever you get your podcasts you'll be able to get Uh, darkness radio we're in a a multitude of places so it says that uh basically if you listen or if you use the listen on stitcher badge or any other stitcher logos branding on our websites uh it should be removed we'll be removing that shortly so if you've gone to our website darknessradioshow.com and you've clicked on listen on stitcher and you've used that badge in order to get the the show thinking, well, aren't you still on Stitcher? No, we're with Audio Boom now. And we've been with Audio Boom now uh, for almost uh, a year and a half, almost two years now. So, yeah, so we're not affiliated with Stitcher in any way now. So if, you, if you've been thinking you've been listening to the show on Stitcher, you haven't been. If you've been thinking you're getting it through Stitcher Premium, you haven't been. Uh, I know a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, there's a fair amount of people that haven't caught up and they think they're still listening to the show on Stitcher and they're not. They say here that listeners will be able to download their show list and re-upload it onto other apps, including, or rather, excluding Spotify and Apple, though they can manually follow shows in those apps. So you can download your show list and re-upload it into other apps, not in Spotify or Apple. So those are the two that you can't do it in. Uh, It says we can let you know that the instructions to do this are located in their frequently asked questions linked from their website, stitcher.com. So any questions you have 
You can go to Stitcher.com. You can also ask their customer service department as to uh, any other questions you have. So again, Stitcher going away August 29th of 2023. That's important to note here. So there you go. Little little PSA from us here at Darkness Radio as far as Stitcher goes. I know I've had quite a few questions from you as far as how that whole transition is going to work if you listen to Stitcher here on Darkness Radio. As far as Darkness Radio goes, we're not going anywhere. We got plenty of great entertainment coming up for you. Got a big week next week as far as uh, Darkness Radio goes. True Crime Tuesday has, I believe it's Ron Shepsiuk, is the way he pronounces his name. And we have an interesting little book about Taco Bell and a killer. I'm not going <laughs> to not going to spoil any more uh, besides that, but that's coming up next Tuesday on True Crime Tuesday. Lots of good stuff coming up next week as well. So we'll keep you informed as the week goes on. It's good to have Beer City Bruiser back. I want to thank Mally Fox and Bob Dennis for filling in. They did a very good job filling in while uh, Beer City Bruiser was away. But like I said, good to have him back as well. So lots of good stuff coming up in the future here on Darkness Radio. Again, want to thank you guys as well for being great listeners. Love you, appreciate you, and thank you for being there. Take care of yourself and each other. Have a good time this weekend. Do something good. Have some good fun out there. Have a great weekend. And also, uh, look out for somebody out there as well. It's going to be hot around the nation. Gosh, is it hot out there. Uh, look in on a neighbor. Make sure that they're okay. This is a time of year where you find out people expire from heat. Uh, they're not well hydrated. They're not cool enough. Heat kills, folks. It, it kills more than the cold weather. So make sure that the neighbor is okay. Maybe check on an elderly neighbor. Make sure they're okay. You know, the elderly a lot of times are on, on blood thinners and things that make them think that they're cold when really they're overheating. So just make sure that that elderly neighbor next door to you is okay. Check on them. Make sure they're okay. Do that for us here at Darkness Radio. Take care of yourself and each other. We will see you next week here for the best in paranormal programming. You've been listening to Darkness Radio.